a.m. session. So it's uh, my privilege to introduce uh, Dr. Ethan Mollick, who's a professor at uh, the Wharton Business School, who will be speaking to us today about games and gamification in HR. So without further ado. Thanks a lot. Yeah. So uh, I'm glad to have you all here. Uh, I just want to yell into it. Uh, so uh, we're going to cover a bunch of things today. I just want to give you a quick introduction to who I am. Uh, so I'm Professor at Wharton. Uh, I have uh, I do a lot of my research about innovation and entrepreneurship, but I've also been studying games for a long time. So not only did I play games growing up, but I wrote a book on games and business, including games and HR. Uh, I've built a bunch of training games for teaching a whole bunch of different things, from the U.S. military uh, to teaching about uh, financial literacy. Uh, games I wrote have been published and are used for uh, teaching in entrepreneurship classes. And some of the work I'll present later on is actually from my research on games in uh, the workplace, and that's with uh, Nancy Rothbard, who's a fellow professor with me. So I'll, I'll explain kind of when I get there. Um, so I wanted to try and cover a few things today that I think are interesting. Uh, I wanted to talk about, first of all, why bother discuss games at all? So why are we having a seemingly frivolous conversation at a uh, serious place like HRO? I want to talk about games as a way to learn and train. Uh, because I think that's one of the really interesting areas. And then I want to talk about gamification and using games as a way to motivate uh, performance and measure performance. So we'll cover all of those aspects uh, today. Uh, and, but if you have questions along the way, feel free to interrupt. So let me frame the question, why games, by first asking you guys a question. Anyone know what this is? Mm. What game is this? Angry Birds. Okay, anyone, anyone ever play Angry Birds? Can you show hands? Okay. So let me ask you, in 2013, we're at the last stats. How many person hours were spent playing Angry Birds? Total for that year. Too many is too many is an answer. I need a number, though. Give me a number. 10 million? All right, any others? OK, so we got a 10 million number. The actual number is 11 billion. OK? <laughs> That's the book of building an empire state building every 6.2 hours in terms of person hours, or Panama Canal every day, right? And this is just Angry Birds, right? This isn't Clash of Clans or anything else. So I mean, what does this tell you, right? This tells you that this, this, is, that this is very motivated, right? People are doing this and doing something that has you know, little social value but a lot of relaxing value. Something here is powerful and interesting, right? And I, I think that that's sort of the reason why, you know, thinking about games. So I want to tell you a few things about sort of the game market base in this. The first thing is that everybody plays games, and I really do mean everybody plays games. Uh, the median age of a gamer is about 37. It's been going up one year every year, so people who play, grew up playing games seem to continue doing it. 99% uh, of teenage boys, 94% of teenage girls play games. Depending on how you cut, what kind of games you use, it actually tends to skew slightly female in terms of average game player. Um, I mean, it's so prevalent now that, in fact, <coughs> the video games of violence debate has become a problem because it turns out 90, uh, that you are much more likely to become a violent sociopath if you don't play violent video games growing up because everybody else does. <laughs> so it, it actually stands out more if you're not doing that sort of thing. So, um, so it, it's a really kind of interesting area. And again, the motivational aspects are pretty amazing. There's 100,000 people right now. Uh, in China who make a living uh, gold farming, which means they play video games and slay monsters and online games for a living, collect the magical swords, and then sell them in real auction houses. Oh and that's actually a lifestyle for 100,000 people, right? Oh. Um, and just to give you another idea, and we'll talk about recruiting a little bit later, but this is a game called the American Army. It came out in, uh, in 2004. It took about a quarter of a percent of the US Army's recruiting budget, right? So a relatively small part. Uh, it was a realistic sort of shooting game. Uh, what was interesting about it is that in order to get your position in this game, you actually had to sit through uh, like army briefings. So you had to actually go through a training regimen. If you wanted to be able to have medical power in the game to heal your allies, you actually had to sit through a 30-minute PowerPoint about CPR in the game world and fill out a scan drop form in the game world to get your rules. So a lot of people did this. In fact, it ended up being the most, second most cited reason after patriotism about why people were interested in joining the army. Uh, and it was so. The impact was more than all the other forms of recruiting advertising combined, right, was this one thing. 
So I mean, these these are kind of these are powerful, right? The issue though has been that we've had a lot of trouble building games that are useful uh, for serious use. And in the game industry, in the game industry, we call this uh, chocolate covered broccoli, right? We take a game and we throw it on top of something that isn't very fun. Like, oh, this is great. Look, it's a quiz. And we're gonna have a great time, right? Answering the stock questions. <laughs> You know, like, and just you can, you can feel the desperation coming through, right? Um, and so it, it's 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 a problem, and you know that's that's problematic because we know games motivate, right? Not only do we see the sort of you know history that I was describing to you, but there's actual evidence from the building of the pyramids that we have this graffiti on some of the blocks of the pyramids indicating that uh, that the groups of uh, workers who were press gang workers, uh, not slaves, were uh, were actually. Made into teams. The one one group is the friends of Khufu, the others are the drunkards of Benkari, and they actually compete to haul the most amount of blocks. They get extra beer rations if they succeed it, right? So 4,000 years ago, games were being used to motivate, and there's a long history of sociological studies looking at games as an important aspect of work. So uh, it makes workers, uh, it gives workers a chance to relax. It gives, when they have a chance to play games, it seems to give them respite. So I mean, this is a long time tradition. So if games are so universal. The question I have for you is, you know, why do we play games at all, right? So what do you think? What's the, what was the, what's the one word answer you give? Fun. Fun, right? Okay, great. So that's cute up my next slide for right? So <laughs> the question is, what makes games fun? And I actually, we're going to do an experiment. So I'd like you, if you have a, a tablet, a phone, something else, I'd like you to take it out because we're going to do a brief uh, experiment here. So what I'd like you to do is go to this web address if you can. Um, and I'll give you a second to do it. So http colon forward slash forward slash gamelab.warden.upen.edu colon 8080. Uh, it should work on any device you have. If you don't want to take any of yours out, you can look at the neighbors. You're about to play games <laughs> called Boomshine. The goal in Boomshine is to, you, where you touch on the screen, you'll see an expanding circle. Where that circle touches the little bubbles floating around, the bubble will pop. Your goal is to pop as many bubbles as you can. Um, hopefully this is, this is coming up for you guys. Um, so let me know. If, let me know if, you have, if it's working. Um, so what I what I want you to do is I'm going to give you guys two minutes to do this, right? And your requirement is to beat level three, all right? So that's after you beat level three, you're done. You can be done, right? But just give this a try. I like this. It's a very simple kind of elemental game. Is it working for anyone yet? Or yeah. Yeah. Uh, so you got to mutter yeses and noes. Is it, is it working for anyone? Hands up. Still typing. Yeah. Okay, still typing. It's working for yeah. you. Okay. Is there a prize? Uh, <laughs> let's get back to that. Actually, it's a really good question. Okay, so um, you know, if only there was a reward system to use uh, for this. So uh, I'll give you guys a minute. Just uh, just show me hands. Hey, anyone else working so far? So She's anyone? cheating. Starting. Okay, so starting. Okay, so it should work. Uh, dot edu colon eighty eight. Okay, so. You, I'm going to give you give you another minute. The goal is to be level three. Again, when you touch the screen, you should see the expanding, or where you click, you should see that expanding dot. It's asking for a credit card on mine. What do you have to do? <laughs> <laughs> Just enter it. Everything will be fine. <laughs> I've been engaged in a very long con in academia with this goal. So I told my kids that too. That's fine. Sorry, get to level three. So if you click on the screen, you'll see the ball expand. Your goal is to you, capture the other ball. Do we have to stop at level three? Do whatever you want. You got, it, you got another. I'm trying to figure out what I'm supposed to do. Give me three levels. Experimenting. Working for you? Yeah. All right. <laughs> I can get you that job application. Just let me talk to you. We're <laughs> <laughs> um, tweeting stuff out. Oh, 100,000. 100,000. Yeah, 100, That's a month? No, 100,000 people. People, yeah. Wow. 345 million Chinese are addicted to the internet. Yeah. So, fortunately, it's small, but still a lot of, a lot of jobs. Okay, I'm going to give you another 30 seconds. Oh, I, it didn't work on me.
screen that's the problem. I know, I'm sorry. It's, it's not you. It's yeah. me. <laughs> okay. That was that again, game side effect. Okay, so let me ask, how many of you, uh, how many of you are playing? How many of you play? managed to get to work? Okay. And how many of you uh, beat level three? How many beat level three? Okay. And did, uh, did any beat level four? Le level five? Six? Wait, so it's kind of seven? Come on, get this hand up. Eight? Oh my god. Nine? Hey, look at it. I, come on. Now we're 10? All right. One away. Wow. Okay. So, all right. Oh so, a couple things to note, right? First of all, you are all busy, important people. You are able to stop playing this nonsense at level three. Uh, no, nobody ever does, really. Or very few people actually do, right? So, I mean, what kept you kind of going here, right? Why, were, why did people keep playing after you could have stopped? And, you know, what, 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 what was engaging about this? Why did you keep going? Fills the gap. Sorry? It just fills the gap. Cool. So it fills the time where I'm not speaking, and email's boring or something. Okay, good. What, so time filler. What, but what specifically about the game? What made it engaging in that kind of way? What made it fun? The feedback of exploding things. Okay, right. So you got this kind of graphical sort of sense of accomplishment, right, of, of things exploding. What else? Competition. Competition, right? You've got you. You look of pride as you kept your hand up, right? I mean, there's a certain natural urge to kind of compete here. Good. Anything else? The colors. Yep. There was there was a sort of artistry to the whole thing. Anything else? Yeah. Looking for a challenge. Yeah. Okay. So challenge. Keep playing until it's hard. Yeah. Okay. So it was getting challenging. Good. Addiction. Sorry. Addiction. Addiction. Okay. There's something sort of inherently addictive in this kind of challenge loop. We'll talk about that in a second. Any any other thoughts? Good. Uh, you know, and so and one thing that people often mention, by the way, that you guys did that I think is implicit in this is this feeling of improvement. And what's funny about this game is, of course, you're not improving at all, right? <laughs> Aside from every player you have to push the button, it's all random. There's no way you have any control after three or four levels about where the balls are bouncing. You're not getting better at it. You just think you are, right? Um, so, I mean, so what, what how does this happen? What, what makes this work? Well, I think you guys kind of mentioned this. What, what makes games fun? The first thing is the social aspect. Competition, cooperation, affiliation. All that stuff matters to us, right? Knowing that we're on a team, working with other people, working against other people, that is an inherently kind of interesting thing. We are, we're, we're geared towards competition and cooperation. Those social aspects that you found in the game are engaging. A second is uh, the idea of sort of understanding how the rules work, kind of figuring it out. That, that's inherently interesting too, right? Playing with reality, discovery, the idea of, of having a system you can play with, right, is, is an interesting thing. And then there's this concept that I'm sure many of you have heard of, the idea of flow. And a lot of things that you talked about were related here. So flow is that feeling of timelessness you get uh, in a task, right? I'm sure everyone's encountered this at least once in their lives where, you know, the time seems to disappear. You're incredibly productive. You're sort of in the moment. And you look up and hours have passed, right? So what causes the state of flow to happen is sort of a perfect tension between, on one hand, boredom, right? Something's too easy. On the other hand, uh, frustration from something being too hard. Right? So if you can get something balanced perfectly in that line between boredom and frustration, you can enter that state of flow where you're highly productive. And games are built to generate flow, right? Because what happens is they keep getting harder to keep you challenged, right? As you were saying, at the exact level of your sort of ability. And we can't do that with work. It's hard to set up work so that it's always exactly engaging, right? But in games, the whole point of a game is to build it so that you stay perfectly engaged the whole time. And that's another thing. This is sort of addictive quality of this feeling of accomplishment despite the fact that you're not actually kind of accomplishing anything, because it makes you feel that way, right? <laughs> the bubbles, the explosions, the award throws at you. And there's lots of other stuff too, right? There's, games are really good at psychological tricks at this point. And that, that, that's become especially true with the advent of these free-to-play mobile games, and I'm sure you've all experienced it in that way, right? Free-to-play mobile games, when you talk to people who create them, it's, it's you know, gambling in a very strange way, but people have gotten very good at analyzing the data and figuring out how to get you super interested, right? So. A degree of randomness matters. I was talking to someone who said that as soon as they put a uh, some sort of random element in the game, like a slot machine that you have to pull to see whether you win or not, uh, engagement goes up three times, right? So the randomness matters. Uh, artistry, you guys were mentioning that. Having clear goals, frequent feedback, all of those things kind of go into what make, makes games special. But what's interesting is the three things that make games fun in sort of a large scale 
map really well the things that games are good at teaching, and that we have trouble training and teaching that otherwise. That's part of the reason why I'm drawn to games from a training perspective. So the social aspect helps us train teamwork and think about teamwork, which is something that's really hard to kind of teach in a regular setting. Uh, so the, simula the simulation is, uh, pulls on this experience game angle, and uh, system games are really good at, uh, at invoking this feeling of flow. And I'll, I'm going to go through each of these to explain why they're important as well. Um, so let's talk about games as a way to learn, um, and let's talk about teamwork first. So a lot of my examples are going to draw from the military because they're one of the few people who's thrown a lot of data at, at the issue of sort of games. Uh, and so one of the things that's interesting is when we try and te teach a teamwork matters, right? You have lots of teams in your organization, high-functioning teams are great, um, and in general, you know, highly trained teams are great. So our vision of uh, how training works when we do teams is usually if you get teams together and do some sort of event to get everyone kind of together. Either they've come off of some sort of, you know, uh, some sort of <laughs> feedback where they've gone to some sort of off-site. And what you hope is once somebody's trained, then after they're done training, they sort of maintain their level of expertise afterwards, right? But as the infamous bathtub chart shows, as soon as we get people out of a classroom setting or training session, their skills almost decay almost immediately, right? And it's one thing if we do refreshers in sort of classroom setting, but for training things like teams, that can be really hard to do. So one of the things that's interesting about games is they're naturally team-based. And so uh, an interesting way of trying to use this has been, has been uh, some observations that the things you do in the game world seem to translate to the real world. So it's easy to do team training in games. And so uh, one of the things to do this was a guy named General Paul Gorman, who was head of US Central Command and a gamer, thought that it would be just as easy to teach people the communication skills they needed to breach a building, so to enter, uh, enter a, a hostile building, using a, uh, using a setting of knights in armor uh, and storming a castle, as you would in sort of a real training scenario. So, uh, given that the military has money, I worked with a group that kind of put this to the test. So we built a, uh, a training scenario in a Dungeons and Dragons-like world. Took military personnel, and instead of there were, instead of artillery, there were wizards. Uh, there were low-flying goblins overhead. And literally, the whole sort of fantasy setup. And we observed communication methods in these teams. And what we found is the high-functioning teams showed the exact same communication patterns in training in these virtual worlds that we would expect them to see in real-world settings, right? So there is a strong, strong translation. And it's not just this, too. There's a nice study by Tom Malone uh, at uh, MIT who and worked with IBM who found that people who exhibit leadership skills in online multiplayer role-playing games, like World of Warcraft, which you may have heard of, like 13 million players there, actually end up showing real leadership in the in same leadership skills in the real world. So it seems to translate. So I don't tell my students yet to put their World of Warcraft experience on their resume, but uh, there's sort of one day that may actually end up being worthwhile. So one thing to think about with games from a teaching perspective is teaching this sort of training stuff, which uh, teamwork stuff, which is otherwise very, very hard to kind of communicate. And it seems like if we train in the virtual world, that carries over. Uh, the second set of games that I think matter are what, I, what are called experience games. Uh, and I think the lesson, there was another military lesson that sort of prompted this, this thought about this. So during the Vietnam War, um, during the Korean War, let's say, the U U.S. Air Force and U.S. Navy both flew, fly airplanes, were very successful against, uh, against the uh, North Korean forces. So for every U.S. plane that was shot down, around 10 to 20 North Korean planes were shot down. So when the air war in Vietnam started, that everyone thought that would go just as well, it didn't. Uh, it turned out that the ratio was about two to one, which was disappointing for the, for the military. And it actually started to get worse, especially for the Navy pilots, where it started to drill off. So what happened, it was interesting, and the reason why I'm telling this story, is in, 19, uh, in 1969, there was a temporary halt on bombing and air raids over North Vietnam. And during that time, both the US Navy and US Air Force decided to figure out what was going on here, what went wrong to kind of make this stuff happen. And the, the Air Force had a lot more money. And they said, OK, well, we, we did this analysis. It turns out the reason why we're, we're, our planes are losing is the technology. Right? They, we have problems with, with where our armor is. Our weapons aren't very good. We have problems with blindness. We're going to redesign the planes. Navy didn't have the money. They spent, the money thinking about they spent their time thinking about training. And they discovered something really interesting, which is that people were much more likely to be shot down in their first few flights. If they survived the first few flights in combat, then they were very likely to continue to survive, right? So it's all about the sort of initial learning curve. So they started something called Top Gun, right? Which was an attempt to do a simulated combat experience to get you through those first couple missions. And this is what happened after that, right? Once air combat returned, US Navy was scoring 12 to 1. 
and the Air Force continued at the same ratio and actually slightly lower. Right? So this idea that you could get experience, that this experience can help you overcome your initial costly mistakes is something that has actually been kind of well demonstrated. And that's another area that games are useful for, right? In this sort of top gun-ish sense. So the learning through simulations and games are really amazing effectiveness numbers, right? So surgeons who use simulators to train are 29% faster, six times less likely to make errors. Um, truck drivers who play realistic driving games actually have 6% higher fuel efficiency when they're actually in the road and much lower accident rates. Um, and so we have all this evidence that playing these re realistic simulators is actually a really powerful kind of tool. And it doesn't just have to be sort of these kind of, um, these kind of you know, technical simulators. So this is a, an interesting um, game that I wouldn't necessarily recommend to anyone called uh, Virtual Leader. And what it is is a meeting simulator. So you go through this game and you have meetings and then you pick your priorities of who you're talking to and what subjects should agree to. And you know, I work with a lot of people who study leadership. I'm not a leadership scholar myself, but I know a lot of people who do. We know a lot about leadership and what makes leadership work. And it turns out the leadership model here is nonsensical, right? It doesn't actually, there's no real academic basis other than it makes for a good game, right? Uh, and yet when, you, when some reasonable follow-up studies were done on this, found that people who had successfully played, who played this game versus other kinds of trainings were 22% better in sort of fulfilling client requests. So almost like another day a week in terms of productivity, six months later. And the question for me at a business school is why? This is disturbing, right? Are we, is everything we're teaching you know, nonsense? Does it not matter? But what I think is actually happening here that's really interesting is that when you play this game, you're forced to play it multiple times, and you're forced to take on different personas each time. So first time through, you play as yourself. Second time, you're asked to be really hard and mean. But the last time, you're asked to be very nice. And you get to see how different reactions play out. right? And I teach in a classroom. Tons of MBA students have these really interesting conversations. And you know, we, we run through all of these cases and discussions. But what happens is everybody's still very concerned about their own persona. They never really experiment with trying to be a forceful communicator, with being more passive, with being more friendly. And what's interesting with this is it's like a flight simulator. It lets you fail and crash multiple times with different styles. And that actually encourages people to think about different approaches to leading and managing. Right? So that's what's kind of interesting about this is that, that sense of power. Um, so I think even in things like you know, teach a, teaching general management skills, simulations can kind of matter and help. Um, and then the most interesting area, I think, is this idea of system games. Um, so the idea is that every part of your organization fits together in some way. And not understanding how that happens is often a cause for disaster, let alone sort of low performance. Right? So lots of stories of this. Um, you know, among my personal favorites, there was an incident in the late 90s with Volvo where their marketing department decided, uh, their product production department, their uh, planning department decided that the next year's color, they would be hot for cars to be green. Uh, and they were tragically wrong. So nobody <laughs> bought green cars. So what of course happened, the marketing department's looking at this, they're saying no green cars are getting sold. Now it's, uh, we should put some promotions on green cars and get them off the lot. And indeed, green car sales shot up, and of course production looked at it and said, great, we're completely right, green cars are hot, let's double down. Right. So like Cisco actually had a similar experience, which was in the late 1990s, everybody wanted Cisco routers, and there weren't enough to go around. So if you were a good salesperson who had made your clients happy, when you got an order, you put in 10 or 20 times the amount you got an order for, with the idea that there was never enough, you'd get 10%, and then you cancel the rest, and you have happy clients who order more in the future, mm -hmm. right? Which was great until the economic collapse and the bursting of the dot-com bubble, where suddenly Cisco had $2.1 billion of overbooked orders that were entirely virtual just to attempt to game the system, right? So this lack of understanding what's happening is actually really hard to kind of teach. But the interesting thing is it's the heart of a lot of good games, right? So anyone know what this game is? SimCity? So the more primitive version of this, this is a really common educational tool, used in fifth and sixth grade, right? And what you do is you plan a city and you build, you know, you build sewage systems and you set up police and you do zoning and you worry about fire and you know, fresh water or transportation. And if, when I actually looked at the number of variables that's, that fifth graders are managing in Sim City, it's over 600 variables. Right, including technical things like density of zoning, right, and degree of water pollution in various areas, and where wind flow was, right. And the idea that you teach people this in a textbook is insane. But in the game, everything fits together in a way that you can play with these variables, right, and understand what's happening. And I think there's some value of that. This is one example from a company of th uh, actually putting people in multiple positions in an organization, getting them a sense of understanding how the system of the organization works overall, right? So what if you actually put people in the role of, you know, let's, let's simulate you in your role, let's simulate you in the role of your boss, 
let's take somebody in another department that you're rivals with, and then you start to understand how the parts of the organization fit together and how your decisions affect other people, right? And so I think it's a really interesting area to kind of think about using games to get other people and these uh, simulations to get people on board. So what does that leave us? With games and training, I think that there's something really exciting here. Um, it's not necessarily easy to do turnkey, so there's not a lot of things I'd recommend to you as like buy this off the shelf, it's amazing. Uh, on the other hand, and rest, it's not that expensive to build a game. I mean, it's expensive. You're, it's going to be $100,000 and up, depending on the situation. But you can actually get some pretty high efficiency gains on the training side. Uh, and something that I think is worth kind of considering moving forward, especially if you get higher engagement, you actually get compliance. Um, there's some kind of exciting, exciting options here. Um, by the way, if you have questions, feel free to interrupt any time. Uh, any, any training issues anyone wants to talk about? Um, so, I want to talk about the other aspect of games. We talked about kind of gamification. I want to talk about games as a way to work. So, um, interesting version of thinking about games for work is actually about image search on the web. So, this is from a few years ago. When uh, this is a search for dog in Google Image Search, right? It's gotten a lot better since for reasons we'll discuss shortly. But what you see is a bunch of pictures of things that may or may not be dogs, right? Um, and the reason is is because computers are usually really bad at recognizing things, right? So it doesn't know what a dog looks like, so it's looking for words around it. Is it a page that's mostly about dogs? This is a picture labeled dog, right? What can we do to sort of pull this out? Um, and so there, a guy named Louis Van Allen, who's a Carnegie Mellon, decided to say, is there a way to create a game that will actually solve these problems? With, in, in, um, so he created something called the ESP game. And the ESP game is a two-player online game. Two players don't know each other. The whole goal of the game is for both players to type the same word. And the only thing those two players have in common is an image. So this is an example of what the ESP game looks like. Right? So here's your picture. Right? And what, you have, what both players get to do is type in their next guess about, the guess about what this picture is. And the goal is, I want to type in the same word the other player does. Right, so what's happening? So I, I see this picture. First thing I type in is dog. If the other person also types dog, we score points and go on to the next picture. Right? No other way to communicate other than this. I never know what their word list is. I only know when we get a match. And then over time, what happens is, as people have said dog multiple times, you build up this list of taboo words, so you can no longer use the word do dog to describe this. Right? So what's happening? You're teaching the computer, right? And you're teaching Google what this image actually is, right? And you're doing it through a game. So people are playing this thing. And, and what you're doing is describing the word, and once I and I have two separate people who can't communicate, both agreeing, that means that they're not trying to pull one over on me, that word's been used enough, I can kind of keep going. There, and so it's a really interesting view. Another version of this game then shows these words back to people and then asks them to click on the part of the picture that best represents this. And if you click, the closer you click, the, uh, the more points you score to your opponent who, or your co-player. Here's what's interesting about that. There, it ended up that 200,000 people play this game, 50 million agreements. Uh, many people play this game for 20 hours a week. Oh my God. Right? Um, and 5,000 people play simultaneously with every image at Google. And actually, Google ended up rolling this out for a number of years and then re retired after it was done of putting this as Google, Google Image Library. So, right? So, you're getting people to do free work for you, basically, right? Because it's interesting and engaging to do so. His next version of this, um, and I hope, I think it's just an experimental phase, it is for the TSA. So the idea is that you've got all these bags being scanned, and you really want multiple eyeballs to look at them, right? So how do we do that? Well, let's turn this into a game where uh, you can log into you know this this game, and you're see, you'll see a mix of actual live images that are coming from some airport somewhere in the nation. You don't know what they are, and exciting fake images with real weapons in them. And your goal is to identify those things that have weapons in them, right? And it's a mix of real and virtual images. And you never know what you're looking at, but if something gets clicked a lot, that's a good sign that the TSA should flag that in real time, right? So hasn't actually been rolled out, but uh, interesting experiment. Um, my favorite kind of example of this, uh, you know, another couple examples rather. So the guy who actually invented, um, who invented this, Louis Vuitton, also invented the captcha. You know, these squiggly words, right? So the goal of those things is to prevent uh, robots, basically automated sign-ups for really like a Google account, so I can send spam, right? And so his clever version of that, you might notice a few of them, they seem to be like actual words. So a lot of the, his, his invention was reCAPTCHA, which actually takes words that are scanned as part of uh, Project Gutenberg that can't be recognized by the computer, uh, and then shows those to humans. And so basically you're helping translate uh, actual text as you go along, right? Mm -hmm. The ironic version of this is a bunch of hackers then came up with a version 
uh, which is a uh, which is a strip poker game uh, aimed at like 13 year old boys. And the object of the game is to type in captchas, uh, and if you do, then you advance in the game. And the captures are pulled live from Google or elsewhere. So you're actually they're, they're harnessing this this group of, of, of boys to basically answer these captcha questions and sign up for spam accounts on behalf of the spammers. So the same tool got kind of flipped around and used that way. And you know, there's been other experiments too. Netflix uh, has been uh, asked has been trying to play with uh, better recommendation systems that actually show people what people's past performance is and ask them to project their kind of future. Uh, future interests. But it's not just the sort of low-tech work. You know, so one of the fundamental problems in, uh, in biochemistry right now is, is uh, about protein folding. So we thought that when we uh, cracked the human genome that we would have the answers to what caused a lot of disease and how, uh, and, you know, how the human body functions. But it turns out the gene codes for proteins. And proteins are a lot more complicated because how they fold in their shape indicates what they'll do. Right? So some pro a protein that could be a strong alternative fuel one way could end up being disease causing if it was folded in a different direction. And the problem is there isn't an easy equation for protein folding. So what you do is you run very complex supercomputer kinds of exercises and then fold in different ways so you kind of get maximum values of a number of points and then you know you fold the protein properly. Uh, what a group at uh, WashU has done has build, uh, built this game called Fold It. And what it does is let people fold a protein, right? And what's happened is that the people who like these kind of Rubik's Cube-like puzzles of trying to figure out how things fit together have been playing in some droves. And um, within three weeks, they, they cracked a protein folding program about an HIV-related virus that has eluded uh, researchers for eight years. Within six weeks, they had come up with a uh, higher, uh, a, uh, a eight times higher energy alternative fuel option than the current version of the same kind of protein. And what's happened is the people who are winning this game are not the biochemists, right? It's actually people who just happen to like this sort of problem, right? So if you're interested in this, if you like these kind of uh, topographical problems, you see this picture and you start itching to be like, I wonder if I can do this, right? If you wouldn't be good at this or it doesn't engage you, you're like, ah, I've got nothing, to, you know, I don't care, right? And that's exactly what's interesting about these games is they engage the people who would be most successful at kind of making them happen, right? Um, so that's this sort of narrow area of using games to do human work. The broader push in games right now has been about gamification, right? So how do we take these aspects of games? Because previously we were talking about games themselves, right? How do we extract out the elements of games, the mechanics of games, and apply them to, uh, to individuals to, make, to motivate them to do things? Uh, and so there's a whole bunch of approaches to doing this. Uh, you know, I've been in this industry for a while and I've kind of watched these various movements rise and fall. Right now, I think gamification is sort of at the peak of the hype cycle. What's frustrating to me about it is there's a lot of interesting power there, and I think it's kind of getting obscured because of a lot of conversation. So what I want to do is tell you a little bit about what makes gamification interesting and powerful. Uh, and I think ultimately, the, the most important part is this idea of an engagement loop. So games are built around engagement loops. They're based around the idea that you have a clear goal, you're given an action to take to get you close to that goal, you're given a feedback about the effects of your action, and then your goals adjust as needed, right? So this is, this is an engagement loop. At the same time, there's a difficulty complexity curve that increases as you get better at this, right? So as you progress through this loop, the action's not the same, it starts to get harder and more complicated, and it's sort of an interesting nonlinear way to keep you in that state of play, right? Um, and so let's take the example of, uh, of Boomshine, right? So what's, what's the goal in Boomshine? Game we just played. Sorry? What's the goal? Where's Tom Chamber at? <laughs> yeah, what's the, uh, right. what's, the what's the game goal? What is your, your goal? Build the chain reaction person. Right, let's get even clear. What, you get a very clear goal. What's your goal at, at each level? Pop the Pop a certain number. Pop a certain number of bubbles, right? It's very clear. It's not just pop bubbles, you're given a very clear indication this is what you need to do to progress. What action do you take? You click, right, and your feedback, you know, write all of the sort of, you know, graphics and artistry, and then that lets you know whether you progress to your goal or not, or your goal increases, right, and over time, that complexity and difficulty increases. More bubbles, clearer goal, but, right, very kind of straightforward set of progression, right? In the same way, right, we have, uh, for example, Angry Birds, right? So you know you have smashed all the pigs, you flick a bird to do it, you see yes. visible destruction as a result, right? And it goes in complexity from this, right, to this. 
And along the whole way, you're sort of taken up, so you constantly feel like you're achieving, right? So what's interesting about these engagement loops, right, is that they give you a constant sense of feedback and accomplishment, even in situations where, as you guys first think about waste time, right? You're not doing anything, but you're feeling so much more accomplishment than work, where these engagement loops are usually diffuse, right, or deeply broken, right? So, you know, often there is a sense that, you know, in these sorts of loops, right, that maybe you're given a goal, let's complete the project, the action, you take a ton of actions to make that happen, you get minimal feedback from senior management, mm -hmm. And then no one ever tells you whether you achieved the goal or not. And then maybe your next assignment's harder and more challenging. Maybe it's easier, right? And maybe it's the same thing. You did a great job, so you'd like to do the same thing over and over again forever, right? I mean, all of this is about ignoring the fundamentals of what motivates people, right? It's, the re it's not surprising that you spend 11 billion man hours playing games instead when you can get this kind of satisfaction from it, right? So one key takeaway is, look, let's think about it, if we had more time, we can go through an exercise thinking about this, but if you think about this engagement loop as a way of thinking about tightening that loop at work, you will actually get you know, performance increases in just a basic way. There's no game element here at all. It's just about thinking about this lesson here about how do we get a clearer set of feedback that's immediate, how do we keep goals, and how do we keep moving those up, right? And that's in some ways part of you know, the goal of, of, of good job design is thinking about exactly these sets of issues, right? Um, and when games don't choose to do this, they have other elements too, um, like the special sauce is, this is a list of hundreds of different kinds of things you could do to make games interesting. So there's a whole like set of this set of stuff, right? So the, so the question becomes, you know, and then what's interesting is we have evidence that games are, really, are extremely motivating, right? Um, and, and, you know, they're motivating in lots of different dimensions. So the question then is, what happens if we actually start taking games and making it work into a game, right? So rather than going through this engagement loop, what if we throw game elements right in? And this is the idea of gamification. Um, and it's an interesting one, right? Because they're so motivating, there's some danger there too. So I want to talk about my research on what makes it good and what makes gamification good and what makes it bad, right? Besides go tease. Um, so I've done this series of research projects at a large uh, Midwestern uh, technology startup company that was pre-IPO uh, with, uh, with Nancy Rothbard, who's a fellow professor at Wharton. And we found this idea of the paradox of mandatory fun, <laughs> right? And this actually applies not just to gamification, but also to company parties and a whole bunch of other areas where there's potential kind of blowback, right? And so here's how this works. So we actually did a couple of experiments. Our first experiment was we took this fast-growing company, and they, uh, we, they let us do a field experiment. So we took a third of the sales force of this company and turned their work into a game, right? So when you actually completed a call in Salesforce, it would trigger a big screen, so all around you can see a picture of someone slamming a ball into a basket. You get a score, the amount of score you got depending on whether it was a hot lead or a cold lead, or you know, a lead that was desirable. So really fully data connected. There was big ESPN style displays that would show people stats, and, and it was set up as sort of a very elaborate sort of uh, game. We took another floor, and we just did leaderboards. So big screens, still the same big screens, but these big screens just told you where everyone was ranked, still kind of graphically nice, but it was no game element, right? So same information about here's how people are doing, but without the game team element involved. And then we had one floor we left it alone, right? Um, and, we did, and we also examined this issue of consent, right? How can, were, buy, were people buying into the game? So the people who bought into the game were those who followed the game closely, understood the rules, and thought the game was fair, right? And what we found was interesting. So these are the conditions, right? So game control and uh, alternative control. And here's what we found. That, that is, there was no effect really in the games. Uh, in, so on the performance side, leaderboards decreased performance. And there's a whole bunch of information about when, uh, and there's a lot of research out there about when showing obvious rankings increases decreased performance. There tends to be a strong gender effect there. Uh, there. It tends to work differently for creative work versus sales oriented work. But leaderboards decrease performance. Um, the and we found that there was a borderline decrease in performance for people who didn't buy into the game, but played it, right? Now, we also measured affect, which in sales is kind of more important because performance is sort of hard to get at in a lot of ways. So affect was they're feeling positive and energized about work, they feel enthused, stuff that we know ties well to creative and sales work. Uh, and we found that if you bought into the game, if you thought the game was fair, you understood the rules, um, and, you, and you followed along with it. It actually had a huge increase on both your aff affect, so your personal feeling of energy at work, and also your attitude towards the company, right? Did you feel that you were part of the company? Did, you, did you know, things that happened bad to the company affect you personally? 
the, all those aspects. And on the other hand, if you did not consent to the game, the affect effect was negative, right? So if you did, you ended up feeling worse about work uh, and less energized at your job, right? So the question became that, well, okay, this is the issue of getting this kind of buy-in piece matters. How do we affect buy-in, right? How do we get people to buy-in and, and what happens there? Uh, so there, there was a couple of things we experimented here. One of them was winning and losing didn't matter. So you'd think that losing the game might decrease buy-in. It, it didn't, right? The winners and losers, there was no real difference. Um, gender didn't play a difference. What seemed to matter is gamers, right, were more likely to buy into this. So if you played a lot of games outside of work, much more likely to buy in, which isn't surprising, right? So your audience matters in some case. But we wanted to find out more. What could we do in the field, right? What could you guys do if you wanted to implement gamification or any other sorts of, you know, supposedly fun kind of motivating program to get the positive effect and not the negative? And again, there's other research that suggests the same things are happening at company parties and retreats and all the other sort of voluntary fun things that actually can, for some people, will actually have the negative blowback effect. So how do you dodge this? So we actually did another set of experiments um, where we created three versions of this, this game. So it's a really simple game. You've got a bunch of shapes. Your goal is to click a button and uh, collect that shape, right? So exact same, a pretty boring, kind of straightforward game setup. And what we did was create this version and two other versions. One, exact same mechanism, but um, we went completely over the top fantasy setting where you were trying to destroy an army of orcs that would explode in gob goblets of blood every time you hit the button, fireballs would shoot across the screen, and there were screams and yells. And then we did the happy farmer version uh, where people were coming to you and you were trying to make the, grow the vegetables or plants they wanted and they'd disappear with a shower of hearts and thank you. Um, and just trying these sort of two very different kind of approaches. And we, what we did was we gave people the choice in some cases, between what, which of these they wanted to play. Some people we didn't give a choice to. Some people we gave a choice to and gave them the opposite of what they wanted. Right? So you have to the preference. <laughs> the, the psychologists have to be tricky. Um, I, I'm, I'm a sociologist by trade, but I've worked with psychologists here. I'm like, wow, you guys are really good. Um, so, uh, and so what happened that was interesting is that, um, is that if you had a choice, right, you actually had, then you, that's what got you to buy into the game. Right, so if you had the choice, if you had a choice about what to play, even before we, we didn't say game or no game, we gave you options. Big increase in buy-in, right? And if we if we didn't give people a choice, right? And but er, if there was no impression of choice. It was somewhere in the middle. And if we gave them the opposite of the choice, it was the opposite, right? And you'd expect this to be for satisfaction, but this was actually for did they understand the rules? Did they think it was fair? Not the process of selection, but the actual game, right? So the whole thing is tainted by a lack of choice, right? So even though we think we're doing something fun, hey, you're going to play a game, isn't that better than you know, doing something boring? If you're imposing it on someone without giving them a choice, or even worse, giving them, if they've expressed preference going against that, it actually taints not just the sort of choice process, but the actual play of the game, right? Which were different, which weren't different any other way, right? So what does this mean? Um, it means that a control study shows that gamification can have a large positive impact, but you actually need to get it right or you end up with a negative blowback, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. uh, and what you see is when people do studies of gamification, so I'm glad to talk to, to an HR crowd, most of that is done about marketing, right? So what happens is you find if we include game elements on our marketing or our website, engagement shoots up. And what they're not measuring is the fact that it's shooting up among some people and the people who don't like it are just not going to that website, right? So they're kind of reporting false data in some ways without knowing it because they're telling you engagement is up but they're not telling you that's because we've turned off some section of the audience, right? Um, and so, and if you oppose this gamification or any other kind of fun event, you end up with this mandatory fun where you get the kind of potential negative effects as well as, as the positives. So what is this, what are the rules here? Um, so games can work really powerfully. They work best when they're voluntary. And when, and when you realize that you don't want a universally fun game, you want a game that appeals to your target audience, right? That can be people inside your organization, demographic segment, and the example of the of folding, right, the folding game. It was fine for it to be really boring for most of you as long as the 1% of people who loved folding and were willing to spend time found that great, right? So there's been at least one game I've presented to each of you where we're like, I can't believe people are doing that, right? That's fine, it doesn't matter that you feel that way if the right target audience feels that this is a good match, right? Uh, and it also helps to have gameplay and real life actions coincide. So and this happens in training too. So there's an issue when you build simulations, you need to actually 
think about including elements like fantasy elements to distance themselves from the real job. Uh, if it's too close to the real job, then it, the difference between reality and fiction blur. Uh, and you can end up with, with uh, inappropriate fidelity, it's called. So well, my favorite example of this, again, a military example, really realistic shooting simulator, uh, very expensive, right? So when, you, when they brought soldiers in to use this, the goal was to get them through as quickly as possible, right? So what they eliminated from the shooting simulator was reload. And it wasn't like they would thought that people would actually forget to reload, right? Because at some point your gun stops working and you need to reload, right? So simulator was great, but what ended up happening is when people were in the field, they had picked up the rhythm of the simulator. So even though they knew they had to reload, their timing of supporting each other and knowing when that was happening and having the pace of, of, of combat was actually hugely off, right? So this idea that if you have something that's realistic, if that doesn't reflect, you want the, the realistic parts to reflect reality and you want the unrealistic parts to be uh, in some ways sketchier, right? Cartoonish or fantasy setting. It's why I actually set a lot of games in sort of purposefully slightly bizarre universes just to kind of force people to engage with the real parts, right, while not having them learn, you know, I don't expect that the people who are playing that Dungeons and Dragons military simulator would actually be expecting wizards to appear, right? So it was great because we didn't have to model the right way in which artillery works because we don't care, right? That wasn't relevant to the game. So this idea of trying to build something completely realistic could also be really dangerous, right? Another few things. Games aren't just another media. It's not like we now have video briefings and you know, like we can show you a tape now instead of having to do classroom instruction. There is something sophisticated and complex here that at its best is extremely motivating and if done badly is chocolate covered broccoli, right? Uh, and you can actually make people act in games, which is really interesting, right? So an experiment I'm trying to work on now and I'm happy to talk with anyone who's interested in, uh, in, in doing this. Um, I've been trying to think about using games to actually do assessment in deep ways, right? So I know from the that Army Simulator, I talked to the America's Army game, I talked to some of the creators of that, and they said that they, within observing 10 minutes of gameplay automatically by the computer, they could give you within two points what your equivalent of the Army SAT would be, right? Because you could watch gameplay and you have enough samples that you could pull data out in really interesting ways. So there's some, they never did it, right, and they kept it quiet. But, um, but the sort of psychometric testing angle is really interesting because you're forcing people to live things rather than just trying to guess what the right answer is. When I create games for my class, uh, I often make them really complicated. The, the underlying logic is clear later, but people aren't given a lot of information early on, partially to sort of prevent them from trying to play the game to win it, right? So um, it's a problem with a lot of simulations where you're just trying to win the game. The goal is to try and create a situation that's richer than that. Um, and I don't have time for the game exercise, so sadly I won't have a chance to do that. But let me give you uh, a couple thoughts and conclusions, and then uh, if you have questions, I'm happy to answer them. So first is games have a long history of effectiveness. If gameplay is already happening in your office, right? People are already doing this as a way to kill time. Um, people are playing games all the time. Billions of man hours are being spent. You know, this is something you can take advantage of. Um, and you have to think about designing games with uh, using both art and science. So if this is something, I think there's huge strategic advantage of getting good at this. And it doesn't have to be everything, right? You don't have to do gamification and training games and recruiting games. But narrowing your focus on one of these can create a lot of value. But you should realize that there isn't going to be a really easy turnkey solution, right? You're not going to go to someone and say, make this thing for me, and they produce it. It just doesn't exist at this point, right? So there's going to be artistry involved. You're going to have to help design this. You're going to be sitting around and figuring out how this works. I, I think the process is really interesting because part of the aspect of designing these things is you actually get to think about the underlying systems and how they work in your business and how they fit together. And the very active game design is actually a really interesting and exciting and sort of educational process. You think about what we're trying to actually teach. How do these things relate? What's the actual feedback people should be getting? So it's sort of like work design in a very kind of small setting. Um, but I really think this is the future. I think the you know, gamification may disappear as a trend, but this is a medium that really matters to people, and it's going to become only more prevalent and more common. Uh, so thinking about how we can use this, I think, will give you a real strategic advantage, uh, both in engaging your population, but also in getting the kinds of performance outcomes that you want to get. So uh, any questions you have? But otherwise, thanks a lot. Yeah. Besides building the Panama Canal, well, what did we do with all these billions of hours before games came along? You, uh, you played uh, Solitaire, or you played Monopoly. Uh, I mean, I'll, chess. Or chess. I mean, there's there's so lots what of these. We lost. It's, we gained a lot. What have we lost? I mean, a lot of people think that you know games are not necessarily that good. So, so the evidence. So, on the grand scale, I'm not related to here. I would say so. There is pretty strong evidence saying suggesting number of hours of watched TV 
uh, decreases future performance in school kids. There's no evidence that games does the same, right? So we haven't found negative, there's the violence links, there's all of that, we just have not found negative effects. There's been a lot of people looking. Uh, there's some evidence that it might increase short-term aggression in some games for some people, but in terms of school impact, there's none. And games seem to be trading off of television time. So if you're asking most immediately, mm -hmm. people would sit in front of the TV and not push buttons, and now they sit in front of the TV and push more buttons, right? And that seems to actually be more advantageous than just sitting in front of the television. Um, so we're losing something, but I think ultimately, as passive entertainment goes, if it was trade off with reading, I might be pulling out my hair more, but there's no real evidence that that's what's happening here, right? Mm -hmm. It's a leisure trade off. The other thing is casual games like Angry Birds, what you're also losing is time in the subway where you're staring at walls, right? Mm -hmm. um, so I, I'm, you know, I'm sure there's some trade-off happening. I'm not sure how dangerous it is. Um, I think it's at least partially mitigated by what's being traded off against. Yeah. The e-commerce uh, company that you did the control study with, did they end up, after that study was over, did they roll that out as a, a public? Uh, so the entire management changed six times over the course of the study. <laughs> so by the end, no one, we didn't even have the names of any of the people, but I tried to get Todd got their lawyers to ask Megan to use their name. All the lawyers were gone. Uh, their entire management team, you know. So, so I would say they, it seemed great. They were really excited about it, but they also had the attention span of a fly. So it was not. I, I don't think we talked about the game. So like literally, they couldn't find anyone to hand the report to. We're like, hey, we've got the results. So like, yeah, and all five of those people are gone, and the people that they hired are gone. So good luck, right? Uh, yeah. How many hours do you play a week? Do I play? Yeah. Uh, I would say probably. Five, five to ten. Like I don't watch TV. This, I read and I do this. Like with my entertainment. Like put the kids to bed and you know I I play a game of working out. Like this is my thing, right? So I mean I'm I'm, I'm an enthusiast clearly, right? This is this in some ways justifies my 13 year old self, right? Yeah. <laughs> uh, I've got a PhD and I do this. Uh, uh, you know, so so there is that. I, I, I want to preface this comment by by saying I don't mean to make this a plug, but it's a bit of a plug, but I think it's interesting for all the HR people in the audience. So my company builds programs that have gamification elements, meaning you don't actually have to take as an ambitious approach to build an entire game, because that's hundreds of thousands of dollars, depending on even a modest game but you can incorporate gamification elements inside programs. So here's the case in point. And talk. So for a big retailer, 250,000 employee size, we have recognition programs and service awards and da-da-da. And then if you happen to be a sales associate, you will see on your screens a slightly different view. And you will have targets for your department. And because if you have sales organization, you have targets, it will say to you, would you like to set yourself a target? And if so, how aggressive do you want your target to be? And the more aggressive you make your target, the bigger the reward. And then it shows you how you're performing against your target. And so it's incorporating uh, a gamification element inside a bigger program. It's voluntary participation, if you want to do that or not. And it also has a reward component to it and will, without disclosing more detailed information, tell you it's zinging along because it speaks to all the things that you were talking about. Now, if you could build a whole game to do things, that would be great, but that's more ambitious. But don't not pursue a gamification approach. You just have to think about in your environment and da -da -da, how would something work, and it's baby steps, you know, and you move slowly, step at a time, and you prove something out, you get more money behind it, you prove something out. But if there's the illustration of telling you this stuff really works and moves dollars, you know, and allows for people to put, play if they want to and if they don't, if they don't want to. Actually, the problem that we're facing is, well, they might do that after hours, and now it's a labor work issue. And of course, I'm laughing going, are you bloody serious? You know? And someone's making an issue out of it somewhere in the country, and whatever, it'll get resolved. But anyway. Uh, no, and so I think that's a valuable point. I mean, there's lots of elements to pull out. I mean, even if you don't do the reward system, thinking about the way games do interfaces can be helpful for you. Um, Zappos has a really cheap, easy game where the goal is to know everyone in the company. So when you log into the internet, you're actually shown the face of someone in the company and asked to identify from a multiple choice list who that person is. And if you don't know who they are, it sends an email to have the two of you meet. All right, so, so I mean, there's lots of ways of applying this in sort of short, short term you know, goals, right? I, I, my, my one way, I think it's completely valuable to take baby steps, but I also, 
I do encourage people to think about jumping in too, because I think that there's different things you can do for those two pieces. And, but I think that's really useful, so thank you. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So would you, would you say that if you take a survey, for example, and you get into, you know, you can have a survey where you're kind of taking a survey and it's like, you know, 92 questions and you have no idea where you are or how, so, but when you structure a survey that gives you consent, do you want to go, you know, do you want to go further, do you want to dive right. deeper? And also with the progress lines that tells you, you know, you've, you've taken 63 of sort of the 92 questions and you're going to, like, these are kind of, so, so that's super. That's super lightweight version of this, right? So if you, I, was, I do a lot of survey work. I was going to gamify a survey one step further. I might think about, you know, you've unlocked different things as you move forward in this. You get, you know, you, you know, you're you're doing better than ten percent of the other people. I think about giving people comparisons immediately on answers. Like, okay, you answered your salary was this. Here's how that fits compared to everyone else. Give me that kind of feedback and help. So there's a lot of kind of cool stuff here that could be talked about. I think we're out of time, but um, I think it's really exciting, and um, hopefully uh, you guys will think about this as well.